Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're going to talk about jazz, one of my favorite topics, with great trailblazers in their own right. Tim Jackson, Artistic Director of Monterey Jazz Festival, Susan Muscarella, President of California Jazz Conservatory, and Randall Klein, Founder and Executive Artistic Director of SF Jazz. Jazz was created by African-American musicians, Foster New Orleans. Jazz drove the music and fashion scene in American urban centers of the 20s and 30s, found its way to Europe in the 30s and 40s, and continues to influence musical styles. Jazz, and this is one of the things that I really uh, find so amazing, it honors and challenges its traditions. It breaks things. Jazz is about in the moment performance. So I'll never get a ch better chance to ask this question. What makes jazz jazz? And if that thing is missing, it's not a jazz performance. I know that you each have had that, that period where you're listening to a performance and you're thinking, uh-uh, no. Tim, what, is, what makes jazz jazz? Well, uh, you know, I first think of that, uh, you know, that old line of, uh, you know, I know it when I hear it. Uh, but I think, I think deeper than that, for me, um, I think first of pulse, pulse in the music um, and uh, a forward energy. And I, I say pulse instead of swing, because to me, uh Jazz is more than just, um, you know, quarter notes on a ride cymbal. Um, it, it doesn't, it, it, that it can be jazz, but it isn't always jazz. Um, so I think more in terms of uh, pulse, which creates forward momentum, uh, that, that's a key marker for me. Uh, I think beyond that, um, there has to be improvisation. There, 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 there has to be communication and um, uh, the ability to uh, cross communicate between uh, the artists on the bandstand. And then I guess, thirdly, for me, uh, a certain emotional uh, reaction uh, to me, all great jazz or any jazz has some kind of emotional content to it that um, uh, I think is used started out the conversation, Mark, you said something about jazz speaks to your heart. And I think that's probably true for, you know, for all of us. So I think that's a big part of the music. So those are kind of three things that really jump out at me. And there's a surprise, isn't there, Susan, right? There's, there's a surprise element where you're, where, where you're moving along <clears throat> and all of a sudden you're surprised by something and then you, you take a different stream. And then you're surprised again. It seems like jazz, as as you see these pieces unfold, surprise is a big element. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that one of the most important elements for me in this style of music is uh, is the element of improvisation. And uh, improvisation could be thought of, of thought of as spontaneous composition. I like to think of it as indeterminate and in that just as you described mark that you're never really sure from one moment to the next what will happen but you know i loved your um description of jazz where you used a couple of terms grammar and structure which i think are really perfect for jazz because it's a style of music with the language all its own and it's it's no different from from how we talk with one another uh, in, in a spontaneous way. We really, for this particular program, for example, did not, didn't rehearse yesterday. The, you know, the four of us did not rehearse yesterday what we were, what we were planning on saying, but yet we're able to improvise and communicate through words. But with jazz, of course, we've got rhythm, melody, and harmony, you know, to deal with. And most of us, you know, of course, all of us really have had more experience with with um, communicating with words than notes. But when you think about music in general, what, what is the one style of music that has the requisite of improvisation? You know, it's the one thing that for, for me, if, 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 if there's no improvisation, then for me, it is not jazz. 
So, Rhonda, what's your answer? What is the thing? What is the thing well, that got you into jazz? Yeah, it's a very hard thing to, to pinpoint. I mean, you know, you talked about surprise. There's, you know, this famous quote by, you know, you know one of the greatest of jazz writers, Whitney Ballier, calls, you know, jazz is the sound of surprise. Uh, to your point about surprise, and it's to Susan's point about improvisation, and to your earlier point also about just the history of the music. I mean, to me, what you, the sound of surprise is always for me around improvisation. I mean, it's great to hear a, a, a through composed piece and it has elements, these things we want to know, but you know, there's elements of the blues in it. There's, you know, there's, there's some pain, there's some suffering, there's some foil that, uh, you know, people had to go through. And uh, I just feel like that's a human quality. I'm not sure that's what you get, exp- you know, exclusively through jazz, but this feeling of humanity uh, that's kind of embedded in the music. Um, but, you know, lots of folk musics have that. I mean, so, you know, as a presenter, you know, SF Jazz has always been to a lot of world music and blues. And, you know, a lot of those musics have similar qualities. You know, and, you know, Tim's point about rhythm, I think, is also a huge part of it. Um, you know, you get there's a pulse. We have a pulse. And so. Jazz, very hard to define, but I think if there's one thing, it's a sense of, you know, call it rhythm or swing and the sense of improvisation and the sound of surprise by blue scale. Right. And that 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 combination of minor and major keys. Right. The the whole the whole idea of, of moving in different directions. Yeah, and communicating, you know, call and response. These are, you know, these are old, old, old things. You know, there's a performer, uh, Rhiannon Giddens, who's performed, you know, for you know a lot of festivals. And, you know, she's not, you know, necessarily a, a jazz performer. She's a great jazz singer and, and interprets stuff and, you know, a lot of music. But, you know, she came to prominence as, uh, you know, finding the African roots of uh, in, in bluegrass music, basically, in, in American folk music. And there you get to try, you know, these roots are convoluted. Uh, you know, you know what we think of a blue scale as originating, you know, these pentatonic scales originating out of Africa. And that's how, uh, you know, this is what, uh, but, but, you know, she, ha- she, her husband's a musicologist, an Italian musicologist. And, you know, one of her most recent records is called There Is No Other. And that record sort of traces the blue scale back to the Islamic slave trade, actually pre uh, West African uh, and how they get it. And so that we, the scale, you know, comes from Islamic culture um, and originally. And so this is kind of, you know, <laughs> jazz is one expression of this kind of human, you know, the, the, the sort of humanity of, of what we are. And jazz, you know, it, you, again, I think Tim, you know, the famous chord, you know, you know, when you hear it, it moves you in some way, but there are lots of musics that move you in a particular way. The one defining think, element is definitely improvisation. You're making such such an amazing point uh, with this sort of international uh, um, uh, roots of jazz, because jazz has now become such an international form. I hear within jazz sometimes uh, riffs that come straight out of uh, the music of, of India, of the continent of India, of, of, of uh, Bollywood popular um, um, uh, uh, music. I hear uh, music that comes out of the Middle East. I hear music that comes out of out of Africa. Um, I hear music that comes out of the United States. Susan, when you're when you're training artists, where do the artists come from? The younger artists that are coming in, what is their perspective now? Are they coming out of this traditional um, uh, uh, jazz and blues world? into your schools with that sensibility? Or are they coming from uh, a cross-fertilized, internet-informed, streaming music accessible uh, perspective where they're they're taking what they hear and fusing it into their art? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think... um... One thing that's important to note is that jazz is a very democratic art form and and very inclusive, and it really allows for everyone to participate in in an equal way. I think that's important to to note. But one um, uh, one thing that I thought was was of utmost utmost importance when I founded the school in 1997 was that we offered a school for the study and performance of jazz and related styles of music. So just as you were saying, Mark, it's, you know, they're, they're, I wouldn't, you know, I know that jazz has come from New Orleans and, and, and has a specific, um, you know, rhythmic um, foundation and, and, and so on, 
but that it it is very inclusive and it in, <clears throat> includes a lot of uh, you know international uh, styles and and influences. And <clears throat> so, for example, when uh, when I started the school, uh, we we began as a community music school. And it it was always for music study, and it was always for relate jazz and related styles of music. But we then in uh, 2009 started a degree program for jazz and related styles of music. But that the uh, the requirements included not only American jazz, but Afro Caribbean, South American, Indian uh, influences. So we tried to. Um, cover cover all the bases and one thing that was important to me uh, in that regard was that uh, the term world music came came about mm-hmm. uh, you probably remember i don't know how many years ago that was but everybody was batting around that term world music and that never really worked for me i i, I was i was always of the mind that if it you know if we were if we were studying brazilian music it was from brazil or if we were studying southeastern indian music it was from south Eastern India. So that that was always really important. So we have 136 uh, credit uh, Bachelor of Music degree in Jazz Studies, and we have uh, requirements in Indian, uh, South American, and uh, Afro-Caribbean music, as well as American jazz. And Tim, as as your as your programming, how do you deal with this with this uh, issue? You know, one of the things that that strikes me in the history of jazz, if you look at somebody like Ellington. Ellington's jazz was informed by European orchestral forms, and the um, and and there was a um, a tremendous uh, exploration of of forms that his parents had been exposed to, and that came out of New Orleans, but also an exploration of the music that he encountered in um, in places like New York City. Um, and he deepened and broadened this. So there was a kind of a dialogue and a juxtaposition between uh, he and the the Hot Fives, Hot Sevens that came out of uh, New Orleans with with Armstrong. But it was it was different. How do you today take what is going on in the world and present that in on your stage in a way that um, ensures that that through line of jazz? remains part of the identity of Monterey Jazz Festival. Well, <clears throat> I, I also think, you know, with, with Ellington, you know, his famous line of there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. Yep. And uh, I, I think for us in the presenting world, um, whether it's, you know, in a large festival or, in, you know, in a small, smaller venue uh, like Wumba Jazz Center, um, it's, the the possibilities I, I find these days the possibilities are endless and that it's um it, it it's a really open book right now and there's um some amazing music out there and as the world gets smaller through technology uh, artists are absorbing more and more influences into their music so I think particularly you have to I mean you have to program for. Uh, your event in your community. I think all, all of our organizations, whether it's SF Jazz or the Jazz Conservatory, we all have our communities that that we work in. And we first and foremost have to be relevant in our particular communities and make sure that we're doing good work in our communities. And I, I think so for, for a large festival like Monterey, um, you know, you have to be, uh, it's wise to be very inclusive. Um, and people, I always get a sense that people come to these larger outdoor festivals out of a sense of adventure, uh, and that they're, they have their specific tastes, what they like, what they don't like, but they're generally, I think, open to hearing new things. And I've always said that if you, say, come to the Monterey Jazz Festival and you like everything that you heard, I'm probably doing something wrong. So, um, so <laughs> let me ask you and you and uh, Randall to to uh, to give your view, because, you know, your your program in Kumba, which is uh, a jazz club in Santa Cruz, and then you're also programming Monterey Jazz Festival. 
Randall has sort of an urban center kind of a uh, of a uh, performing arts center that is dedicated to jazz and associated arts. So, Tim, starting with you and then and then Randall, when you look out at that audience and you're envisioning that for either the three day festival or for Quimba and Randall, as you're looking out, I, I'd like to hear how you think about the program, because some people I love artists who I know. Right. But I also love to be surprised. So how do you balance your programs so that you are engaging people in the familiar, but you're also driving awareness of new music and you're supporting artists who are worthy of support, need that audience awareness? How do you do that? Isn't that I mean, that's part of the magic because you don't want to alienate people. You don't want to bore them. Tim, how do you how do you do that? Is it is it really magic? Do you have like a magician's hat and you pull out, you know? No, it's not magic. <laughs> um, I actually go back to um, uh, to a line, actually, Randall, that you told me years and years ago. Or you actually didn't tell me, but it came up in a conversation and it was I'm paraphrasing, but we were talking about artistry and artists and how the musicians are really the artists of this music and the art form. And the folks that are in our role in uh, presenting and producing are really more the craftsmen uh, where, you know, we've learned certain skills. Um, we've uh, done a lot of study, uh, a lot of work over the years to um, and, and taken very seriously what we do. Um, and, you know, that gives does give us, I think, certain skill sets to help try and program. And it's also about the relationships that we built with artists um, over the years. Um, uh, oftentimes, you know, whether it's Monterey or SF Jazz, we you know, we all have our relationships, uh, specific relationships that allow us to create special programs and special opportunities um, that um you know, can I, I won't use the word unique, but but give us some some special um, uh, some special opportunities to present artists in certain ways. But Mark, you kind of answered the question. You said it's really it's all about balance. People do want to come see artists that they know and love, but they're also if they're into jazz, they are going to be into that sound of surprise, and they want to hear something new. You know, Randall, I, I just recently saw a performance by Kevin Moore, Ke Kev Mo, um, at SF Jazz. And one of the things that I, first of all, the, <clears throat> guy, the ultimate pro, and he's the, he's such an amazing, amazing artist. But he also educated me from the stage, from the stage. I was a little kid listening to a storyteller. And I learned is that what you're doing in part by what you present? Yes. Uh, you know, it's a complex system, basically. You know, you know how it all works. Tim is kind of getting at the sort of the crux of it. You know, in, in essence, we're curators. And, you know, as curators, you, you, there's a great quote from a guy named Gary Stewart, who was very instrumental in the beginning of programming at, at Apple Music and, uh, was uh, the sort of driving force between Rhino Records re-releases. And, and his quote is, it goes something like, you know, curation is not about what you like. And he tries to put yourself in the position of what, Mark, you like <laughs> sitting in the Kevmo audience. And you're going to find this, you know, balance. Again, you know, it's Tim's point. It's not just a balance between the different kinds of things you're doing, but it's the, the balance about, you know, how you can find inroads, what's popular, you know, what's considered popular, but what's considered interesting. And so, Everyone has to develop a point of view about this, you know, of some kind, you know, a distinctive point of view that and, and the system, you know, relies heavily on the artists. Obviously, they're the most important part of it and what they offer, but audiences and developing audiences over long term. So, you know, if you know, we are, we have a program called membership and, you know, some people have been members of SF Jazz. And one of the, you know, the primary benefits of being a member is, you know, access to tickets, you know, good, you know, good tickets first. And so you're right you know, They're self-identifying as fans, you know, sort of coming in. Um, and, um, you know, we try to incent them to, to be experimental. And, you know, they, you know, we have one program, it's called, you know, take 10, which is when people buy tickets for a season and a season may have, 
you know, close to 500 concerts in it. And, you know, you know, how do you decide what you want to go to? And but if you buy 10 tickets, you'll get a 10 percent discount on everything you bought. And, you know, say you buy nine tickets to Kepmo might have been one of your your concerts and you're you're spending a, a, you know, a, a, a lot of money for a sing, you know, a ticket for that. And you're and you've committed to, you know, nine things you love and you, you're you're done. And then you start looking, oh, if I take the show, you know, we have two performance spaces. One is uh, called the Joe Henderson Lab, which is a hundred seat room versus the 700 seat room we have. And uh, you see an artist that, oh, that looks interesting. Well, for a twenty five dollar ticket, which those prices are lower, you can experiment a little bit. And we try to you know find subtle ways other than you know giving people information to incent them to to be experimental. And it's incredible how um, how successful that actually is. Um, you know when people get exposed to things they don't know because there's a gateway you have to go through. You have to pay. <laughs> And if you're going to pay, you want to make sure you're getting a value. So this is part of the system. You know, you've got to not only keep in mind, you know, artistic integrity and what people like, but, you know, how you develop an audience. And so over, you know, 40 years or you know, 30 plus years of a, re a membership program, the audience is a little, you know, that, that more than anything is, you know, provide our point of view. The audience, uh, I hear it a lot from performers, you know, your audiences are different. In, in, in other words, we've, 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 help cultivate a particular point of view in our audience, you know, over, over years. And, you know, that's a long-term thing here. So, I mean, you're getting to things and, and back to, you know, what jazz is and, and, and different influences, you know, it, it's, it's, that's part of what we're trying to define. It's open, you know, jazz happens to be a word uh, like lots of things, you know, that's convenient, you know, that you have to categorize something. And, you know, we have a definition to, sorry to go, but it's all tied together. And I'm, rambling a bit here. Uh, but, you know, we present jazz is at the core of what present what we present, but we also present music that jazz has influenced, which means a lot of contemporary forms, particularly in classical music and in and, and music that uh, um, jazz has been influenced by. So that's when you go back to the roots of, of things. And there's some amazing sort well, of you're creating a you're creating an educational experience for the for the audience from the stage. Right. Ideally, yes. An uh, enjoyable and educational Ideally, nobody experience. knows that's happening. <laughs> now, Susan, as an educator, is actually is actually helping to cultivate the artists who will present from your stages, hopefully, uh, going forward. Susan, Randall made a really interesting point, right? The price of admission is a ticket. Money becomes a barrier to experiencing art because these organizations need to sustain themselves or to becoming educated in that art form. And you have developed a school from the ground up. You rolled up your sleeves and, oh my God, right? I mean, looking at the stories of these organizations, Randall starting off with, you know, itinerant, an itinerant organization that was just trying to grab some space for the artists to perform and figuring out how to bring an art, uh, an audience together at that time, you trying to create a school out of nothing. How do you actually balance those needs of, of cultivating artists who are great and also ensuring that you uh, maintain the financial wherewithal to advance this? How does that work? Well, I mortgaged my house. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> I feel I believed in it, you know, so strongly that I thought, well, this is the only way this is going to happen. So that's that's how we started out. But in all seriousness, getting back to um, the conversation uh, that uh, and, and and following up on what Tim and Randall have said, you know, I really think it's our responsibility to educate uh, both students and audiences, um, and um, I think it really is our responsibility to give them a, a, a broad perspective. And, and if you think back to uh, when some of the artists who are performing today, who are so, so well known and loved, when they first started playing, you know, I'm sure people were skeptical. Like I remember when Bitches Brew came out um, and I was very, very young, I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? And now I listen back to Bitches Brew and, you know, it's part of it's it, it's it's in, you know, a big a big piece of the puzzle, and um, 
uh, so, so for example, when we do anything at the school, we try to take that in, into consideration. It's not so much what Susan likes, it's what, you know, I want to give them a broad perspective. So, and also give them something that they would not be able to get otherwise. Like, for example, uh, in, in, in our degree program, we have a, a social science, re- social sciences requirement that's four semesters that's non-transferable. It's taught by uh, Smithsonian scholar, Dr. Anthony Brown, and it's it's the history of jazz. It's 12 credits that are that is a requirement, starting with the African roots of jazz and moving to 2023. And um, we have different uh, scholars come in and give give their opinions and uh, cite examples and and so on. So it really gives students the entire the entire uh, picture. Of, of, of the history of the music. And, um, you know, even, the, the other thing is, it's a little bit off topic, but one thing that I, I, I wanted to make sure to, to say is that, you know, I think that um, jazz in the Bay Area has been really successful uh, or as, as successful it is, as it has been, you know, thanks in, in huge part to Tim and Randall, but it's also because, you um, our organizations don't really compete. They really complement one another. For example, Tim and Randall have uh, a presenting organization with an educational component, and we have an education educational organization with a with a performance component. So, putting us putting the three of us together really, I think, contributes to the strength that jazz has maintained in in in, in our Bay Area. That was my feeling as as an observer of of this um, that that there is an ecosystem that you have developed over decades that creates a center of jazz. If you take a look at how jazz has moved out because it has come become unaffordable in certain neighborhoods, particularly in San Francisco, mm-hmm. um, the jazz still thrives <laughs> in this region because of you. And I think that that's really important for the health of the music ecosystem. So I want to ask you all a a really important question. It's about the commercialization, the consolidation in a corporatized uh, form of of the music business, um, where the streamers basically are the gatekeepers to the works of artists. Artists aren't necessarily earning, other than the, the top artists aren't earning that much. Uh, from their works, um, the number of live stages that are open um, uh, to uh, uh, in the ways that yours are open um, are are uh, limited, um, and uh, it, it's a real it's a real problem for the cultivation of a vibrant uh, art form. Uh, what do you all think? And I, I'll I'll uh, start with uh, you, Tim. Go to Susan, and then. Um, uh, give a round of the last word. What do you all think in terms of how to best cultivate um, this musical form, the audiences, create these experiences, these enjoyable events um, in a way that that continues to benefit the artists who are delivering to us these types of experiences? Uh, Tim, do you believe that there, that we have a a threat of of the corporatization of music, or do you think that it's just part and parcel of the ecosystem that always exists and there's always going to be a dialogue and it's just, we'll find its own balance. Uh, I I think there's definitely uh, a turmoil right right now. There's a lot of change going on. Uh, The music delivery systems have really changed uh, over the years and certainly over my career. Uh, I worry that it it becomes harder for artists to uh, to make a living, um, particularly with their recorded music. Um, and I think that that puts um, a, additional uh, responsibility on the presenters and producers, uh, particularly for folks like Randall and myself, uh, that we play such an important uh, role in the financial ecosystem, I think, for for jazz musicians now, because I think for a lot of musicians, uh, touring and performing is 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 a is a major source of of income. So I think that that's um, it it fuels my 
fire in the sense that I, I I feel that responsibility for our for the organizations that I'm involved with and for the field in general, and that it's really important that uh, we have strength and can develop uh, and, and nurture the the performing spaces uh, that we have. Susan, what do you think uh, about this this uh, question of developing artists and and finding a way to uh, remove financial barriers uh, to uh, artists who have the talent but perhaps don't have the money? How do you feel about that? Well, we make every effort to um, to contribute, you know, to their being able to. Uh, do their work, uh, become artists. Our, our tagline is uh, in a in as a in a musician and out of an artist. Um, and um, for example, we have one um, sponsor right now uh, who is the founder of Jam Bar, the uh, organic artisan energy bar. Jennifer Maxwell. She was the founder of Power Bar, and she has been critical to to our success in the last, especially in the last five years. And then, of course, when COVID hit, that uh, really had a negative impact on on everybody, including us. And but uh, Jennifer Maxwell is a, is a jazz drummer, and she's been she's been playing in the jazz school, the community music program, for many many years. And I've gotten to know her over the years, and she has an appreciation for the art form, you know, for the time that it, that it that is um, invested in becoming an artist for uh, featuring artists um, of note. For example, we have uh, now a series that uh, we that it's titled uh, Jambar presents and she's enabled us to present um, big names like uh, Joe Lovano this weekend, this coming weekend, we have Mike, Mike Stern, um, you know, we've we've had uh, access to these artists thanks to her, and what what we're what we're able to do is to give our students and our audiences an experience that we would otherwise not be able to give them, given the size of our venue. For example, um, we we are we're not a Monterey Jazz Festival or an SF Jazz, and that was actually by design. I I, I was interested in a you know, 100 seat, 1940s intimate jazz club. <laughs> so, but what that, but that's very prohibitive. I mean, how could we pay, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't really afford a Joe Lovano or, um, uh, you know, a Mike Stern or, or uh, we had Dave Liebman a couple of weeks ago and so on. So you, you've probably seen the, the ads for that, that concert series. So what I feel proud of is that, She's enabled us to bring something to the Bay Area, at least to our own students and our own audiences that we would not otherwise be able to to do. And I'm very grateful to her for that. Well, and you get you get the world that you invest in, right? The return on investment, what you're saying is the return on investment here is jazz. It's great music. Mm -hmm. Randall, I remember when I worked for you uh doing that that search for your development uh, head you and i sat in your office you don't remember this conversation i'm sure and we were talking about how you approach a a, a donor who does not play an instrument and may only go to concerts and performances rarely and you talked about the fact that that investment is going to get that person something that their other investments will not. And that will be music, right? That will be jazz. Mm -hmm. And that's what you, and that's what Susan's talking about. Mm -hmm. How do you cultivate that future in a way? Because we're buying our future. If we if we don't buy music, we won't have music. It's really that simple, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the, you're, we're back to the ecosystem here, you know, you know, the, the complexity of the ecosystem and, and the, the, the thing that works, you know, that, that doesn't work for anybody here um, in, in this ecosystem with, without artists, it doesn't work. And this happens to be both the most challenging time for distribution models, as Tim's referring to, and, and you know, 
But it also is, uh, and in the last 10 plus years, has been a, a, a kind of a beautiful, brave new world of artists being able to talk directly to their audiences by yes. you know, initially through YouTube. Um, and, you know, I've run across artists, you know, again, the artist wants to be an artist. They don't need to be their own promoter. And, you know, that's a difficult role to play, you know, both. However, people have a chance to talk via these social media platforms to audiences that they've never had direct access to. And I know people who've made good livings from this and have been savvy about it and know the same game that Tim and I play to try to get audiences in to get people to watch their YouTube channel or to, you know, to, to do that. And so artists now can sell records. Bandcamp is another great example of something where artists sell their, their self-produced records through. And, you know, that distribution channel was something that was not there. And this is, you know, worldwide. And, you know, so, so this long tailish thing that the, the internet promised us for jazz and a niche form, uh, you know, can still be harnessed. It's challenging. It, it's out there, but, you know, you all, you, you said something earlier, Mark, about, you know, you know, organizations need revenue to, to be there. But the key thing is artists need revenue for us to need revenue. That's exactly right. Artists need to make a living in order for us to have access to their art. We ought to give greater appreciation to that fact. That is the one indelible. And I want to share with you um, uh, two of our, our three polls. 100% of the respondents, when we asked, what is the best experience of music? 100% said, no, no, uh, no doubt live performance live performance is the way is the preferred way it gives us people the most joy so if we're going to have the most joy let's give the most access to live performance and then the other the other poll which is just amazing we said what do you think is the biggest barrier today for jazz to thrive as an art form and it's really lack of musical education and exposure it goes to susan's work tim's work randall's work all of you being able to create that exposure and create that enjoyable experience of music, but also an educational one. And, and the access to instruments was another one. The, the cost of live uh, performance was another, was another issue. Barriers that we can actually address. And you are doing that every day through uh, Quimba and Monterey Jazz Festival, through SF Jazz, and Susan through California Jazz Conservatory. Thank you so much for sharing this. We could go on for, for another half hour, but we've come to the end of our time. Tim Jackson, Artistic Director of Monterey Jazz Festival and Quimba, Susan Muscarella, President of California Jazz Conservatory, and Randall Klein, Founder and Executive Artistic Director of <laughs> SF Jazz. You have made my life better just by helping me to understand your world and by also presenting music that is just so wonderful that I enjoy Thank you so much. Please thank your, your staffs, your boards, your, your donors, your audiences. And most of all, as Randall says, as Tim says, as Susan says, the artists, the artists who we need to all support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark.